Hi, I'm Courtney, and as you may know, in 2022, I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. I know that when I was getting ready to hike this trail, YouTube was a really helpful resource for me, and I think it is for a lot of people, but there can be a lot of assumed knowledge going into something like your first through hike. So I just wanted to sit down and have a chat about all the things that I wish I had known going in to the PCT. A lot of the questions in this video came from comments on my YouTube post and also over on Instagram. So thank you if you did ask a question. And if you have any follow-up questions after this video, please shoot me a DM on Instagram. I would be happy to answer. So where do we even start? I know that I felt really overwhelmed starting to plan my PCT through hike because you know that you're going to need a visa, you're going to have to wait in line for your permit, you're going to have to secure flights, get all your gear, and it feels like everything is a little bit reliant on everything else. Um, I would say if you are international, start by applying for your B2 holiday visa. This can take a while, and especially in a post-COVID world, I know that I had to fly across the country for my visa interview appointment because there were none here until the following year. And I flew over in one day and it was only a month before I was meant to start hiking. So there was a lot of uncertainty before I was meant to head overseas. Obviously, not everyone is going to need a visa. If you're lucky enough to already live in the US, then your first step will most likely be securing your PCT permit. This process has changed a little bit since I applied, but from what I understand, you will basically need to pre-register in October, and this will give you access to the application once it opens up in November. So you will be given a time between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. At that point in time, you can access the application and pick your dates. It is really important to be flexible with this date as there are only 35 permits in November per day and 15 permits in the January release. So you may not get the day that you were hoping for and if that's the case, there is no need to stress. I would recommend refreshing the page in the lead up to the hiking season. A lot of the time people will cancel their permit and if you're quick enough, you can nab it. Of course, if you get a date that you absolutely cannot do or it would be unsafe for you to hike, you can also use the local permit process, which is a little bit more complicated, but will get you the date that you are after. I will also link below the PCTA page on applying for an application so that you can read up a little more there if needed. So that's the boring stuff. Let's say that you've gotten your visa, you've booked your flights, your travel insurance, and you've got your permit. Now you can actually start getting excited for your hike. A lot of people wanted to know if you need to put in physical preparation before doing something like the PCT. Personally, I am quite healthy and fairly young, so my advice may not apply to everybody and I would not take my word as gospel, but I, the longest hike I had done before the PCT was probably about 60 Ks over two days. I had been running a lot because I was training for a marathon, but in terms of hiking, I really did quite little preparation. What I would recommend is doing a bit of strength work just to make sure that you're not going to get any injuries on trail. And while you're at it, you might as well set up a bit of a stretch routine that you can carry on whilst you're on trail. So that might be just some really simple four to five stretches that you do before bed every night, just again to help prevent injury. What you will want to do if you have never through hiked before is something called a shakedown hike. Basically, this is an overnighter or a multi-day hike where you test out all of the gear you're going to be using 
on your through hike. So for me, I did one of these just before I left and it was pouring rain, but it meant that I realized I wouldn't need the rain poncho that I had packed. And I was also able to wear in my shoes, which was really useful. So I highly recommend a shakedown hike. Where is my rain jacket? Here! <laughs> oh my god, I'm gonna have an emotional breakdown. <laughs> I really wouldn't stress if you haven't been able to do too much physical preparation before taking on the PCT, as long as you are prepared to listen to your body and then minus 10%. So what I mean by that is if you think on day one you can hike 20 miles comfortably, hike 18. It's really easy to get caught up in the excitement of wanting to reach a certain place or keep up with a certain group of people, but at the end of the day, it can end your journey early. So listen to your body and stick to your guns and you will end up in a much better place. Eventually, your fitness is going to pick up just by being on the trail and hiking every day and your mileage will get more and more as you move through the trail. One thing I wish I had done prior to hopping on trail was really get on top of my pre-existing injuries. So for me, I had a knee injury from running and that meant that once I was on trail, that injury got a little bit worse and it starts to snowball, an issue with your knees turns into an issue with your feet, you start walking funny, so you get horrible blisters and on and on it goes. So as much as possible, I would recommend to try and get on top of your injuries before starting the trail. Obviously, sometimes starting with an injury is unavoidable. And what I would say is a lot of people out there are struggling with their own injuries. So I really wouldn't stress as long as you're planning to take care of yourself. I, in my personal experience, the muscles around my knee strengthened as I continued to hike and eventually the injury got less and less severe as I continued on. Some of the things that you might like to do on the trail is carry a cork massage ball and you can roll out your feet every night before you go to bed. This is something that I did a fair bit. Something else I would recommend is when you wake up in the morning, walking around without your pack on for a little while, just to allow your body to warm up before you start intensely hiking for the day. Of course, if you do find that you need help along the trail, like a physio or a chiropractor, there are some great resources out there, but you only have one body, so do with that what you will. Probably the biggest topic for discussion that I received was gear. I hadn't planned on making a gear video just because there is already so much information out there, but if it's something that you would be interested in hearing me talking more about, I will happily make a video for that also. This is just some really basic high level stuff. So again, as an international hiker, obviously there are some brands or some products that I really wanted to use, but I couldn't get my hands on in Australia. Uh, so I was able to ship these items to the trail angels I was staying with the night before I started, which was really useful because I didn't have any contacts in the US. You can easily find trail angels by using the Facebook groups or by using Far Out and most of the time they will be really willing to help you. I did also have some questions about luxury items and how I kept my pack relatively light. Now I completely understand that the ultralight movement isn't for everyone and this is really going to be a game of preferences. So for me, luxury items, I carried a pair of sandals which I used as my camp shoes and I actually found these mostly beneficial in towns because I was able to air out my feet and wear something different on my feet for a day or two. Of course, they aren't completely necessary. You could not use a camp shoe or you could go the old inner soles and shoelaces trick. But for me, it was a luxury I liked to have. I also carried a sit pad, which was basically just a piece of a foam mattress cut off that I had found in a hiker box. And I also started with a stove to cook my food. 
Although to my own surprise, I actually started cold soaking about a month in and I sent my stove ahead to the end of the trail. When it comes to these kind of items, it really just depends whether the luxury of that particular item's output is worth more to you than the luxury of not having to carry its weight on your back every minute of every day. But of course, there is always the option to send things home or if you're international, you could send them forward in a bounce box. So I really wouldn't stress too much about these items if you do have them in your pack already. For clothes, I was really set on finding something that I could wear for the entire trail and that was really high quality. And I did end up wearing the exact same outfit the whole time, with the exception of the hat that I replaced uh, about halfway through. I did actually have my shorts snag on a bush about a week from the end and they ripped out the entire side of my shorts, um, but I just stitched it back up with my little sewing kit and I honestly still wear them now. I run super cold, so it was really important for me to have layers that I could interchange depending on the weather. So I did carry a fleece, a down jacket and a raincoat, and for me that was the best option. I did however hike with a couple of guys who didn't have or got rid of their down jacket, their rain jacket or both, and they were absolutely fine. So it really just depends on your preferences and also the year that you're hiking and what the weather conditions look like. Next hike, I will definitely not be taking town clothes. On the PCT, I had a t-shirt and a little pair of Lycra shorts that I would wear in town. And these honestly are not really worth the wait. So when you're in town, your laundry will usually only take an hour to two hours. You can wear your rain pants and your rain jacket. And then after your laundry is done, you can just get changed back into your hiking clothes. So I will not be carrying those next time around. Lots of people do swap out their clothes on the trail and there are some pretty awesome outfitters along the way if you decide to do that. And of course, there is always the option to bounce things forward. So if you find in the desert that you are needing your down jacket, you can always bounce that forward to the start of the Sierra. Finally, shoes. Now, I would not send my shoes ahead of time, and that is for two main reasons. Your feet are likely to grow while you're on the PCT, uh, and it's also really easy to find shoes on the trail, whether that is in store or online, and you can just have them shipped to the nearest town. What I would say is order your shoes slightly earlier than you think you will need them because a lot of people end up walking in shoes that have completely fallen apart before they are able to swap them out. And finally, I have the question of is a fanny pack worth it? And we Australians call it a bum bag. <laughs> but yes, I found it absolutely worthwhile. It's really great when you're in towns and you're able to carry your phone and your wallet and anything extra you might need around without taking your whole pack. Uh, it was also super handy to carry around my camera, which was a DJI Pocket 2, which is this guy over here. It was the perfect size to put inside of my bum bag. And it also meant that I could bag it up in a Ziploc and keep it safe if it ever rained. If you're carrying a slightly larger camera, then it might be a little bit better for you to use one of the Peak Designs camera clips and they just go on the shoulder of your pack and they're super easy to access. So that brings me to the next question, which was how I filmed the PCT, how I managed my files and also how I kept everything charged. So I used a 20,000 milliamp anchor power bank and this was fantastic for making sure I could charge my phone, my watch, my Garmin, and my camera, and I never had any issues running out of charge. It is a slightly bit heavier, but for me, it was well worth it. In terms of file management, the DJI Pocket 2 is really fantastic in that it is a small gimbal camera, and it also has an attachment which you can plug into your iPhone, which means that I could upload all my footage to the cloud whenever I got into town. It is also super important for me to mention that not all the footage in my film was shot on the DJI. 
A lot of it was shot by my amazing partner Jack and he was using a Sony 6300 so that's where you would have seen the really nice slow-mo clips and the really zoomed shots. My biggest advice when it comes to capturing your trip is to just do it. It doesn't matter what gear you're using or what you plan to do with the footage or the photos afterwards, it's just something really nice to look back on, even if it was shot on an iPhone. And with that, I also say take photos of the people. My favorite records I have of the trip are the ones that include the people I hiked with. Now obviously the PCT is not a cheap ambition and this is something that I had quite a few comments about. I personally spent way more than I thought I would and a lot of people that I hiked with actually said the same. So my biggest advice with finances is over prepare. Now this can obviously vary wildly depending on how you want to experience the trail, how you manage town days and what kind of food you have in your resupply. Also if you're international you will need to remember that you will have to tip and for this I don't just mean on your purchases but if you are offered a ride or accommodation from a trail angel it is the courteous thing to do to chip in a little bit of money whether that's for petrol or other expenses they've incurred in order to help you out. So of course your upfront expenses before you start hiking are going to be related to your flights, your travel insurance, which by the way, please get travel insurance, your gear and a whole range of other things. You'll want to make sure that the, at the end of preparing all of these things, you still have ample spending money left over. So for me, this was between seven and eight thousand Australian dollars. And even then I was running a little bit short towards the end. I know personally I would have been devastated if I had got really close to the end and run out of money, which according to the Halfway Anywhere surveys that they do every year, actually happens to a lot of people. So definitely, definitely over prepare financially when it comes to through hiking. Now, whilst on trail, you are going to encounter towns and in these towns, there are certain things that you're going to want to do. The first of those being sleep in a real bed. So for some people, this might mean getting a hotel room all to themselves. Obviously this can get quite exy, especially if you're in one of the more remote towns. Um, but you could also share a hotel room or an Airbnb with other hikers that you've met along the way. You could stay in a hostel or you could reach out to a trail angel and see if they can accommodate you either in their house or in their yard. If none of these options work for you, there is always the idea of going in and out of town in just one day. And that means you can camp back at the trailhead, which is of course free. <laughs> Some other things that you might want to do along the way are shower and do laundry. Most towns will be able to accommodate this with a coin op. And so general rule would be a shower would be $3. Your washing machine would be about $3 and your dryer would be $3 if you choose to use it. Of course, you may need to replace gear along the trail. It may wear out. It may lo no longer suit your needs or a lot of people just lose things. So you may need to replace things. For me, this was my backpack really early on. It was not suiting my needs and it was really necessary for me to change this to be able to continue on with my hike. Also included in that is going to be your shoes. So most hikers go through four to six pairs of shoes and obviously you'll want to factor these into your budget. Now you want to make sure that you've got a buffer in case of emergencies, if you need to see a doctor or a physio along the trail as well. And then finally is your resupply. And this can vary quite a lot depending on how you plan on eating. So ramen bombs and honey buns are obviously going to be cheaper than dehydrated meals and supplemented products. It really depends here how you want to compromise on nutrition versus finances. So we may as well talk about food while we're on the topic and there are a lot of options when it comes to food. Firstly, you've got the cold soak, cook or no cook. 
Then you have the option of sending resupply boxes or resupplying in grocery stores along the way. And then of course there are dietary requirements and intolerances and that sort of thing as well. So personally, when I'm at home, I eat vegan. That is just my preference. And that's absolutely doable on the trail. There's a great Facebook group that is for vegans who are hiking the PCT and it will tell you all the places that you can get the products you will need along the trail and some great tips for that as well. Personally, I found that I ended up incorporating a little bit of dairy back into my diet while I was over there. And that is mostly because a lot of the things that I wanted to eat did contain a little bit of milk powder anyways. Of course, if you've got specific dietary requirements, you may find it a little bit harder to resupply along the trail and you may find it a bit easier to send yourself boxes ahead of time. A lot of people do this. You can create your boxes and send them to a post office or a lodge along the trail. And it means that when you get to town, your resupply is done for you. So I did not do this and that's for a couple of reasons. The first being that my food preferences change almost weekly and I knew that food that I'd packed in March would not really appeal to me anymore in September. The other is that because I'm not from the US, I didn't have anyone that could actually send my boxes throughout the trail. So I would be reliant on those post offices or lodges holding on to my boxes for up to four months, which in a lot of cases just isn't possible. I did however send boxes in Washington and that is just because there aren't as many options for a resupply there. So when I was in Portland or maybe you'll stop in Bend uh, and I had the luxury of a few more bigger grocery stores, I just packaged up about four boxes and shipped them ahead for the rest of Washington. This was a lot easier at this point too because I knew exactly how much food I needed and also what foods I was enjoying on the trail. Something that you will absolutely do on the trail is overpack your very first food carry. Everyone does it. The thing about hiker hunger is that it doesn't kick in straight away. And so personally, I had a few weeks at the start where I really didn't have any appetite and a lot of my food went to waste. So then comes the big question, to cold soak or not to cold soak? And I really thought this was a two option thing, but I learned pretty quickly there is also a third option. So of course you can carry a stove and this means that you will have a lot more variety when it comes to food. You can use dehydrated meals and you're always going to be able to have that cozy meal when it gets a little chilly. The downside of this is that you will have to carry and resupply gas and it can be a little bit more difficult in the smaller towns when they start running low on stock. I personally cold soaked and so most people will get a little ice cream jar with a screw lid or any sort of plastic jar with a screw lid. You can put oats or couscous or rice in this and a bit of cold water and just let it soak while you're hiking. This is obviously a little bit lighter because you don't have to carry your cooking equipment, but it does narrow down your choices on what you can eat. Now for the third choice, this is no cook. And a few of the people that I hiked with actually did this. So they would usually eat tortillas with meat sticks or cheese or peanut butter. They would have packet pastries and a lot of bars. Obviously it can be a little bit trickier to get your nutrition in eating this way, but you don't have to carry any cooking tools. So it is a little bit lighter and there is no preparation for your food as well. So how do you know where you can resupply or where you can camp or what the condition of the trail is like ahead? This is actually a super easy answer. And that is there is an app called Far Out. It's basically a map of the whole PCT broken into your five sections. So it will be desert, Sierra, NorCal, Oregon, and Washington. It costs about $60 US for the whole thing. And the great thing is it will have icons along the way for where you can camp, where you can get water, and a whole range of other things. And people can comment on these waypoints. So it will always be up to date with exactly what's going on at that point in time. 
Some people choose to use paper maps and a compass as well as or instead of far out. I personally didn't think that it was worth the wait, especially considering I knew that I had a power bank large enough to always keep my phone charged. It is important that you do have some form of maps while you're on the trail. Whilst the PCT is really well marked, if it has recently snowed or if the trail intersects with another trail, it can get a little bit confusing. And the last thing you want is to be lost in the wilderness. And then we walked a mile in the wrong direction. We're back on trail now though. It's gonna be a good day. A really interesting question that I got was how I dealt with and overcame fear on the trail. I had planned to start hiking solo and to do that for at least the whole desert before I met up with Jack who was already over there. Unfortunately, because of the issues with my knees, which were being caused by the fact that I was carrying more weight than I was used to with the long water carries, Jack decided to come back and help me carry some of that weight which I am super grateful for because I would never have finished without him. But I had prepared to hike the first stretch on my own. And so as a female especially, there are a few things that you want to be cautious of. I wasn't really worried about animals. I had done my research on snake bites and how to deal with bears and mountain lions. And as someone who's not from the US, the prospect of seeing one of these things actually really excited me. And I'm yet to see a single rattlesnake, but we're currently up in the mountains and we just saw our first bear cub. I couldn't get the camera out quick enough to film it, but everyone was ecstatic. The things that did scare me were extreme weather, dehydration and potentially hitchhikes gone wrong. I think the only way to overcome these fears is just to be as prepared as you possibly can and to also set yourself some boundaries before starting the trail. So for me, I learned how to pitch my tent in extreme weather conditions. I learned the signs of hypothermia, exhaustion and dehydration. And I also set myself the boundary that I would never get in a hitch alone. Because the PCT is so highly trafficked, it really isn't an issue if you reach a road crossing where you're going to hitch to just sit and wait for somebody else to show up. I did have a few scary hitchhiking experiences, so I am really grateful that I set this boundary ahead of time. What I would say is once you're on trail, you think you're going to be scared, but the excitement sort of takes over and you forget to worry about those things. I had no trouble camping alone and sleeping in my own tent at night, even though I'd only really done it a handful of times before the PCT. And all of the wildlife encounters that I did have were absolutely amazing experiences. Along with fear, there are a million other emotions that you're going to feel on trail and they're likely going to be feelings that you've never encountered before. So when you're on trail, unlike real life, you don't have your usual coping mechanisms. So you can't binge eat or scroll your phone or make yourself extra busy. You are just stuck with you and your raw thoughts. And so for a lot of people, this is great and leads to some amazing decision making and realizations, but for others, it can be really overwhelming and a lot to deal with. And for me, I definitely felt that at some times. I am in no way a therapist, and this is gonna be a completely different experience for every single person, but I have a couple of small tips that helped me when I got into those ruts. So the first and absolute foremost is music. I didn't really listen to music on an everyday basis while I was on the trail. Um, and that's because I saved it for those days when I was feeling really low, whether that was to put on a boppy tune and pick myself back up or to put on an amazing orchestral piece as I was cresting a mountain or something like that. Music really made all the difference for me. The other thing is hiking with others. So even if you're in a trail family, you will often be hiking alone during the day and then you get together and camp in the nighttime. But I think 
hiking with others and being able to have that connection and that conversation is a really great way to sort of pick yourself up when you're not feeling the best. And finally, rest. Just because your body isn't broken to absolute pieces does not mean you don't need rest and sometimes just having a day in town to be able to catch up on a bit of sleep, call your friends and family at home and get some proper nutrition into your body is enough to sort of perk you back up and get you back in the right headspace to be hiking. So people ask what I would do differently next time and I think there are two separate sort of answers here because there is what would I do if I was through hiking for the very first time again with hindsight? And then there is what will I be doing on my next adventure now that I have actually through hiked the PCT. So if I were someone preparing for the PCT in 2023 or any year after that, I think I would want to say pack less food. You are not going to eat all of that. I would want to keep a journal every day. And whether that's something really small or whether that's a video journal, I would just want that record of every single day. So I would keep one of those. I would take more pictures and more pictures of people, including trail angels. And I would take rest when rest is needed. For me on my next adventure though, I think the goals are a little bit different. Next adventure, I want to go in feeling my optimal fitness. And so I don't wanna to have to go through that transition stage of getting used to the trail again. I just wanna be able to enjoy it from the start. And so I will be doing a little bit more training before I get on trail next time. I also hope to document my adventure a little bit better next time. And I will achieve that by planning out uh, or storyboarding my videos a little bit better beforehand so I know exactly what shots I want to get. I will also start cold soaking next time because now I know that that works best for me. And I also wanna set myself a few little challenges or little goals like potentially walking 24 hour stretch or a certain mile goal or something along those lines. Finally, I'm going to touch a little bit on hygiene um, and particularly feminine hygiene. So if that doesn't apply to you, you are more than welcome to end the video here. Um, but obviously you are going to be going a week, sometimes more without a proper shower. Um, and on trail, you do have to pack out any wet wipes or toilet paper or anything like that that you might use. So personally, I carried wipes and that was really great because it doesn't take many of them to feel clean. And then also if you're on a long uh, stretch without a shower and you're dry camping, you can very easily wipe down your legs or your pits and feel a little bit clean when you get into bed at night. I did also carry a cooler cloth and this is fantastic for when you need to pee. Um, I just attached it to my bum bag and it meant that I could unclip it and use it with my pack on and I didn't have to take my pack off every time I needed to go to the bathroom, which was great. In terms of my period, there are many options that you can do here, but personally, I used a menstrual cup and I found that was absolutely fine. Um, I know that many people will use tampons, but of course you have to pack those out and you obviously will have to carry that around for up to a week. So the other option could be period undies and I think these would work really well, um, but obviously that's not what I used on my hike. Most people don't take deodorant on the trail and I would not recommend taking deodorant on the trail. You will absolutely get used to all of the natural smells out there. And by the end of the trail, you don't really smell anyone's BO anymore. It's more offensive to your nostrils to smell uh, perfume or washing detergent or something like that. So I would not bother with deodorant, but I guess that is personal preference. What you doing? I'm washing my feet. Why? Because they're dirty. They're dirty, dirty girls. <laughs> so that is all I'm going to talk about today. I feel like I have rambled long enough. 
There are so many things that I could talk about uh, when it comes to through hiking and the PCT specifically. So if there is a question that I haven't answered and that you would like answered, please let me know. Send me a DM on Instagram or comment on this video. And if we need to make a part two, we can make a part two. Thank you for watching and I hope this has been helpful in some way. And I will see you next time.